but in real estate, all this stuff is in any way. They could come here, and they could have come on the same as he's the maker of Carlos and I give him information about the program. Uh, has written a very important book and article about the infrastructure, which has been really full of our thoughts for a while. And then he said that uh, maybe when you're cut, I was thinking in a part of the book, and at the same time, uh, one Carlos was reading the book on infrastructure, but at some point I wrote that I said, reading the money is fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> In English, I hope it's in the English, right? So, I know this is something else, but I don't know if it's on the English word, you're going to bring that to us. Here we are. Uh, I think I'm not going to present it, but I'm not going to have to go around the table to see who is who, and I'm going to do the introduction of the presentation, and I would like to have a little bit of it, so I'm going to do the intro. Yes, I'm and I'm the director of research and policy here at the next center. Hello, I'm Lucas Sivitala, and I'm the director of the center. And you're taking care of the work as a department. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm the student of economics and law. I'm the director of our research. Uh, which which department? Which department? Ah, okay. So I would say this is the amendment, actually. I'm Simone Vasco, and uh, I'm a research fellow of the next center. I'm Mr. Prodeucci, uh, I'm a fellow here at the next center, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Trent. And I'm Robert. Uh, glad, to be, glad to be back. Uh, I guess it was two years ago that I uh, presented the infrastructure book, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the next one uh, in the series. Um, it's called Governing Knowledge Can Come, so it sort of relates to the work of the work of the academic And you guys have heard about the PhD program of uh, uh, Giovanni doing his job. Um, so let me tell you, so we're, we're both coming, coming out in, in supposed to be in August, I think more like in September, we're coming out in October. Um, it's my co-author, Mike like Madison, Kat Spender, uh, they're both law professors uh, as well. We've been working on this project for about eight years, um, and we will be working on this project for the next 15 years. Right, so what about thought? I'm a thought of the book. Um, uh, in, in detail, I'm talk about some motivations for the book and sort of, sort of the, um, how it draws inspiration on our in this work, uh, in particular. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the future, uh, as we're sort of, in, in a sense, in the recruiting mode, we're sort of bringing in scholars and researchers from around the world and from different disciplines, sort of fit into the fold of sort of systematically studying knowledge and using it, I think I'm going to talk about just a moment. Um, so, <coughs> the, uh, I'm going to start with two during lessons from Eleanor Austin. So I wrote a piece in the Journal of Institutional Economics to sort of contribute to the last year, uh, and that was titled an article, and really summarizes, in a sense, the gist of, of what we're doing in this big project and what we're doing in this book. Uh, so two, the two lessons can be summarized, as you see on the PowerPoint slide, they can be summarized as something to us, in a sense, about something the work we do as scholars, embrace complexity and context, or simply reality. Uh, and then on a logical lesson, um, which is to embrace systematic evolutionary learning um, and be wary of disciplinary and neurological lines. Okay, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that as we go on. And uh, really the first lesson leads to the second. Right? Right. Anyone right. can say uh, one should embrace some complexity and study reality. Right? Right. Many people say it all the time. Right? And we, all of us probably say that. 
What made Ella Elmer Austin incredibly special, the uh, reason she was uh, she won the Nobel Prize in Economics, she was political scientist, not an economist, what made her so special is that she worked tirelessly to develop a robust framework for doing it. And then she did it over 30 years. 30 plus years she spent time systematically studying and applying the framework um, and working from these two lessons. Now I'm sure everyone is probably familiar uh, with uh, Garrett Hardin's description of the tragedy, the tragedy of the commons, right? Um, that was the uh, the allegory or model that dis that was incredibly distorting in the world of environmental uh, economics and policy, right? So at its core, let me ask you just very quickly. Recently, we were discussing on this paper again with the Marco, and they rewrote it once again, and then now, from the, after 40 years more, 48 years, I guess. Uh, I'm surprised that an article of that kind that had such a huge influence. Was it directly? Was it the fact that it was published in you know, a prestigious journal? It doesn't seem to me of a high enough intellectual quality to have such a profound effect. Maybe you can uh, also add a comment on the fact that it has been taken up by Harold Demsetzer, who is a very influential um, economist and law and economic scholar. So in some way, it was very poor, the starting point, but then there has been a magnifying lens by them. So this would yeah. be my explanation. So there's a lot of things that, so I can try to explain. It's sort of the, eco, the history of economic thought aspect of it is, is kind of tricky. Um, and I'm not an economic historian, so I hesitate to go down that road. Um, uh, what I would say, is, and this is true today also, people are attracted to simple models. Right? Simple models are attractive because they make the world seem simple and easy to explain. And what's particularly attractive about the tragedy of the commons problem, and I'll, I'll say a bit about this, is that it defines the problem in a simple way and it leads to a simple set of solutions that we can fight about. Right? So that's part of it. The other part of it is the whole concept of an externality was new to economics, uh, really just emerging in economics in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, Elaine Marziano has written a bunch about this. Uh, economic historian in, in France. Uh, um, he and I actually have an article on Coast coming out shortly, sort of reinterpreting the understanding of the problem of social costs. But the whole idea of externalities, even where Dempsey took it, was just a really in, in the 60s, just emerging as a concept. And so uh, Garrett Hardin comes with a relatively simple model, um, published in Science, as you said, a very prestigious journal, so got widespread uh, attention, um, and it sort of caught flame. Right. Maybe because it was a simple model, maybe because a lot of other people were sim similarly tackling other sets of problems. But they said it's common, so never work. And if they somehow worked in the past, it was only because of war, blood, and diseases. And this is so historically superficial. Right. But he wasn't a historian. Right. There's lots he of was a biologist. Right. There's, but there's lots of examples. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to sort of pull off of your question and keep going. Okay. But there's plenty of examples where someone comes up with a simple model and they ignore history. Right? I mean, and even Ronald Coase's uh, story about the lighthouse, right, the response right. to the lighthouse, turned out not to be completely historically accurate. Um, nonetheless, it's a, it's a powerful article, it's a powerful debate, I guess you think of that about things more in a more complicated fashion. Right? But that, this happens quite frequently. Um, but what you're highlighting is actually what I'm going to say, which is really I think, that it's distorting. And you know, sometimes you can add, in high, well, I, the other simple answer is um, you know, things are 2020 in hindsight, right? So looking back, you could say it was a simple model and it was so obviously flawed, but at the time, people who were reading it were not thinking that, right? They weren't sort of, immediate. they were instead attracted to the beauty of the model and what they explain certain things that intuitively seemed obvious. Yeah, but Kampolani is not what before. But many of the people who read science didn't read more than that, right? So it, 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 different audience, different audience, broader audience, different story. Yeah, but right? to, to depend on the poor guy with the thing. <laughs> but I mean, uh, sometimes adding a, a powerful uh, idea with uh, an example and a nice name attached to it, a nice label. I mean, this is powerful. I mean, I'm happy that uh, we have this article in terms of 
one of the, of the small pieces of our puzzle to think about the world, then if, if you take seriously the fact that uh, in the reconstruction of human history, the commons never worked, okay, this was not actually the, uh, the object of the article, it was just a stupid sentence written there. But it, it's true that, that commons may fail. In common, commons do fail, yeah. Right, so that, that this will this will tie in, right? But there's lots of other metaphors that jump out, like open, openness. Yeah. Ooh, we all love it. But in fact, systematically studying openness may lead you to conclude that openness is very it, it may be exceptionally good rather than normally good. We don't know, right? A lot of times, simple you know, simple models, simple words that have sort of rhetorical flourish capture attention and sort of you know, are easy to go. Those are amazing facts. Try to make comments. Yes, we don't want to hold you. So let me get back. Let me get back to this because this is—I mean, it's right on, on, on par with, with where we're going, right? So at its core, what the what the, the Chargers of Commons is it illustrates a, a standard externality problem, which, as I said, was sort of relatively new to the economics discourse. It was just starting to be studied at that point. Um, the way to understand it is unconstrained consumption is not sustainable, so constraints of some sort have to be introduced. Government regulation and privatization are the two top-down solutions that Hardin recognizes as being possible. Right? So many analysts in public policy, in economics, and political science, in a variety of fields, simply assume that the tragedy commons model itself uh, describe a normal problem, right? And that the binary solution set bottom: privatization to enable markets or government regulation top-down. Um, Oakstrom challenged the entire enterprise at its roots right, by asking two foundational sets of questions. Uh, first, how well does the tragedy commons describe reality? Is it a useful theory for making predictions about real world behavior? Does it describe a normal or exceptional situation? Right? Second, does the binary choice between government command and control regulation and private property enabled market reflect a full range of institutional options? Are there alternatives? Right? Obviously, these two sets of questions are related. Um, like many social scientists, although he wasn't, he was a, as you point out, a biologist, Hardin made a series of assumptions. But everyone who followed him also made a series of assumptions. Here they are. Right? So Ocean pulls out. Here are the assumptions that undergird this as a theory. Right? When the assumptions hold and fully describe the resource setting that we're talking about, or the context we're talking about, the theory's predictions can be quite useful. Well, you can't really read that very well if you, if you do, uh, but it's exceptional. Right? Um, it's not normal that these assumptions hold. The tragedy of the commons allegory rarely describes shared resource settings in a sufficiently complete manner as to qualify as a useful theory for making predictions or for prescribing regulatory solutions. Okay? This leads to Ostrom's second or substantive lesson, really. Um, so look, the deep problem with the tragedy of the commons is not the allegory itself, right? Or its translation into a model, or even a theory about how people might externalize costs in specific settings. The problem, the deep problem, is the myopia that the model induced and the binary government or market thinking that followed. Now think about the way you think about lots of things, right? We consistently make the mistake of thinking in binary terms like this, individual or social, private or public, market or government, and so on and so forth. This kind of thinking leads to great distortions in our perceptions about the world and the plans we make. Right? Now, standing alone, this may be underwhelming. You might be thinking, this isn't really a lesson. We all know that studying reality beats studying fictitious constructed scenarios. Naturally, the next question is, how? How to study reality, right? So Ostrom was a scientist. Her response was to do the scientific work of systematically studying actual resource systems and governance institutions. This is what leads to her methodological lesson. Ostrom did not presume, as many do today in the context of knowledge commons, right? She didn't presume that community-based institutions were successful or that they were ubiquitous, right? Community-based institutions themselves require systematic study. To facilitate research on these institutions across diverse resource systems, Ostrom worked for decades 
not like in a year, and all of a sudden declare that she had the answer. She worked for decades on developing a scientific approach to studying and evaluating institutions. So she developed uh, the institutional analysis and development framework. It structures a common set of research questions to apply across diverse contexts. So it's been applied to lots of natural resource and environmental situations, you know, fisheries, agricultural properties, and so on. In the book, we talk about you could you could use it to study stock soccer leagues. You could you know study soccer or football is the way everywhere else outside the United States describes it, right? You could study football systematically. You want to understand how the rules and institutions and communities across the world, how outcomes are different and vary based on the institutional structure. You could study football. Right, ranging from youth leagues to professional, ranging from different communities of participants, and you'd observe that the patterns of outcomes in games and in the society that sort of adopted those rules might very well differ. You could, in other words, you could use this framework for studying institutions in a variety of contexts, not just environmental contexts. In fact, perhaps we could use it to study knowledge contexts, which is what we're going, which what we're going to do. So look, I should have said this. The results of Ostrom's approach, again, over. 30 plus years, not over the course of a year or two, right? And Knowledge so, Commons was the late edition, I would say, in the last 10 years. Yeah, and then Knowledge Commons are just, just yeah. recent. So all of her work is not focused on Knowledge Commons per se. She, came up, she had a book with Charlotte Charlie Pest in 2005, yes. started it, and then so we built off of that. But Ostrom famously came out with these design principles, which aren't really design principles, but I won't go down that road unless in QA people want to, um, for governing sustainable resources, right? And this is based on looking at hundreds of case, you know, lots and lots of case studies through the framework, as well as game theory models, experiments, lots of work, which you can, and came up with a, a number of different meta principles uh, for understanding, you know, how some of the conditions where they seem to work and otherwise might like, not things to study. Now, look, our proposal is to take a similar approach to study knowledge comments, but I want to be very clear up front: we don't anticipate under, un uncovering the same design principles. In the environmental area, it's even a mistake to just take these design principles and like these design principles and map or throw them onto any given cooperative arrangement involving natural resources. It doesn't necessarily work, right? Um, the context and nuance and variety of things will, will shape what you want to do on the ground. Um, but in the knowledge con commons context, we anticipate different principles emerging over time, in part because intellectual resources are fundamentally different than natural and environmental resources. And one context, one broad sense, because they're not rivalrous in consumption, right? They can be shared at zero marginal cost, right? Um, and, um, and another uh, complication is that the resources are created, not just managed, right? And so often you're talking about sustainable creation and sharing becomes uh, gives rise to a different set of dilemmas when you're trying to rely on community-based commons institutions as opposed to alternatives. <coughs> now. Back to allegories and distorting models. Um, it turns out that intellectual resources also have their own allegory. They also have their own simple model. Right? Those of you who study intellectual property or study knowledge, well, we know this already. So fuck okay with me. Um, it usually involves the invocation of the free rider. I just want to say. Like, we all free ride all the time, right? Free riding is totally fine. But anyway, I'll, I'll make this point in, in a second. Uh, replace Harvard's pasture with an intellectual resource. For example, an idea. If it's openly accessible, in other words, if consumption is not constrained, everyone could profitably make use of the idea. We'll do so as much and as, and as often and in whatever manner suits them. Now, so what, you may ask? Where's the tragedy in that, of course? There's no depletion, so there's no ruin. But as you all know, ideas are public goods. The trouble is that unlike a pasture, ideas are products of human intellect. They must be created and often require investment. Right? So unconstrained consumption presents a risk for potential investors. We might call these consumers free riders because they're getting a free ride on the idea creator's investment. So when you view it from a dynamic perspective, tragic underproduction of intellectual resources appears at first glance, to be an inevitable social dilemma, tragedy, right? In remarkable parallelism, many analysts in the public policy, economics, law that study these fields, right, 
Many analysts simply assume the free rider allegory describes a normal rather than an exceptional problem. And again, remarkably, a binary solution set follows. Society must either turn to production subsidized by the government, think basic research and education on one hand, or to intellectual property enabled markets on the other. Right. So the free rider allegory has played a powerful role in shaping the relevant discourse, policy, and law over time. Yet, we should focus on reality and be wary of powerful allegories. Right. So following Ostrom, we again should ask two foundational sets of questions. Right. Is the free rider allegory describe realities? Is it useful for making predictions about real world behavior of individuals? Does it describe a normal or exceptional situation? Right. Are there alternatives left off the page because we're so focused on intellectual property or government subsidization? Now, I would say, as I said a few minutes ago, free riding is quite normal. We do it all the time. Free riding is absolutely essential to key social processes like competition. Competition couldn't exist without free riding. Okay? Like right, uh, if I may, speech. If I may add some insight by Professor Kaplan in, in a hurried view of copyright, he said, I doubt that uh, there are fundamental human rights. But if there is one, it's the right to imitate. I love it. Without which children would never grow to become adults. I think that this is capturing a, a huge chance. This demonization of free riding neglects that in ordinary situation, imitation and free riding is good. I'm going to use that. So you, I got to remember that example. That's beautiful, right? So yeah, right. in order to evolve and to learn, to form beliefs and preferences, you need to, and to develop skills, you often need to imitate. Right. So it's it's just speech, communications, human capital development, you can go to a whole list of things that just wouldn't work without some degree of free riding. So the relevant, the difficult and relevant question is whether free riding that involves intellectual resources in particular systematically reduces incentives to invest in such resources. Whether private incentives are insufficiently suppressed by the risk of free riding depends substantially on the type of investment, the intellectual resource in question, and the context. Many intellectual resources plainly are not subject to this concern. Right? So in many situations, people make investments regardless of whether or not others will free ride. And so in the, in the book, and a bunch of papers I've already written, you may be, some of you may be familiar with, I give lots of examples and sort of talk about you know, all the different situations in winter time. So I'm not going to go down that road right now. Bottom line is that reality is considerably more complex than the free rider incentive allegory suggests. Allegory rarely describes shared resource settings in a sufficiently complete manner to qualify as a useful theory for making predictions or prescribing solutions. Don't misunderstand. It's not that free riding doesn't exist. It does, as I said a second ago. And it, and it sometimes certainly matters, even in the context of intellectual resources. But much more is needed to describe reality, to design institutions, or to prescribe policy. Even in situations where free riding in fact reduces incentives to invest. Right? So let's just assume that. Right? Let's put aside that there's a lot going on or doesn't, but let's assume it does impact incentives to invest, and a social underproduction dilemma may arise. It turns out there are many additional complications that are too easily overlooked when you adopt this frame. Right? In other words, Ostrom's substantive lesson applies with equal force. First, there are no panaceas. Government subsidies and intellectual property rights are far from perfect. Second, there are many alternative solutions that people regularly employ to avoid tragedy. And in fact, commons Right, are important set of alternatives that we should assume work always work or not. Right, but we should, cons are an important set of alternatives that deserve systematic study. So when I'm talking about commons for, for purposes of this project, those of you who've heard me talk about infrastructure commons know that I think about commons at different levels. And for infrastructure, we're talk, usually talking about uh, uh, public, publicly accessible on non-discriminatory terms because the, there's no community, members of the community, non-members, no boundary that we think about. Infrastructure usually, not always. 
For this project, it's a little different. For this project, there are community members and, and there are non-members, right? So Commons refers to the institutionalized community practice of sharing information, science, knowledge, data, and other types of intellectual and cultural resources. Many communities regularly share such resources and over, overcome concerns about free riding. And frankly, as we found out in this book and we're seeing in other studies, right, various other dilemmas. It's not just the free rider dilemma that comments can sometimes help overcome. It's other social dilemmas associated with sustainable information sharing and production. <clears throat> okay. Most obvious may be research comments, given the importance of sharing and collaboration norms within scientific research universities. But there are many, many less obvious examples, which we are talk about in the book, we, and I'll show you in a second some of the examples. Um, there, are just very, there are many different types of comments in the cultural environment that we know very little about them. Right? So this, is, this is the, I've sort of gone through this already to, to some degree, these are some of the motivations. Now, in the past decade, um, as Marco suggested, right, scholars have sort of started to pay attention to these things, right? They've started various disciplines have become interested in these types of comments, and some have begun case studies. However, this is my critique, our critique. However, the research too often is focused narrowly on a specific case or an isolated area. So, for example, academic publishing or open source software, and it fails to investigate broader institutional questions. They tend to consider only a limited number of descriptive variables which makes integration and learning from a body of research and case studies incredibly difficult. In other words, if I took all of the, in the last decade, took all of the papers written about patent pools and open source and Wikipedia, and you name your favorite knowledge comments that all of you may study, I threw them on this table, cleared all these other junk off the table, threw them on the table, and we sort of, we randomly chose 15 or 10. We said, you know, what can we learn from these 15 or 10 as a subset? You'd find that the descriptive variables cover, uh, there's very little overlap in the descriptive variables that they cover. Because the patent pool, first and the lawyers studying patent pools think that inventions and patents are the relevant knowledge resource being shared. They ignore tacit knowledge, they ignore negative information about losses, the things that they don't pursue, they ignore institutional details, right? And that's not their fault. I'm not criticizing the person who does that. The point is just that people are within their own discipline and they're studying it for a certain purpose. Right? So you've got a lot of you know, people who study Wikipedia, there's some really interesting case studies that are out there, but the range of descriptive variables that they, that they gather information on are too limited to be of much use in a broader understanding, a broader understanding of knowledge comments. So guided by Ostrom's methodological approach uh, and building on our framework, as well as that of many others, uh, Mike, Kathy, and I developed a research framework that facilitates systematic study of knowledge comments. Um, the underlying nature and structure of the inquiry, as well as the focus on complexity, context, communities, and institutions, <coughs> excuse me, unites our project with her legacy. But for various reasons, we needed to adapt and extend the ID framework to account for significant differences. Funny thing is, this is an aside, um, we're, I'm a, a member of the workshop uh, at Indiana, the Ostrom workshop on political theory and political analysis. And they just had a big workshop on the workshop. Uh, a week ago, and so we were there. And one of the presentations, someone was giving sort of a presentation of different research frameworks within that school of thought, and they put up a slide. Someone said, look, can you put up a slide of, a, of the, uh, just the conventional IAD framework? Uh, and the funny thing is, instead of putting up this, they put up this. It didn't have action produced, it didn't have our ad on action produced resource outcomes, it didn't have our explanation of blue, but they used our adapted IAD framework as sort of the, as the, which we found quite interesting. Um, uh, in part, because I think it's more dynamic than the prior, the existing ID framework. Um, look, so we had to adapt it in part because when people are acting on a daily basis, people you're studying, and they're, they're, they're acting on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, and you're studying them and what they do, and their action situations, right, they're producing resources, so there's, we added a feedback loop at the top that goes back to the resource characteristics. But that's not usually the case with environmental resources or natural resources, but it's true for in, in the knowledge context. Um, the other thing is we got rid of the box on outcomes because the outcomes are really only really decipherable as patterns of interaction and through a feedback back into the resources in the, in the knowledge context. Because when you're interacting, you're generating resources and community members are interacting in certain ways. And so this makes it more dynamic. 
Um, and then we're still thinking about the evaluative criteria. Um, but you know, the most obvious reason for adaptation is the resources are different, right? And what that means, though, is that there's different obstacles to overcome for institutionalized sharing to work. Um, not only do community members tend or manage existing resources, you know, how they're used and preserved or curated, which is really important, um, but they also manage new contributions and how they're sort of worked back in and then shared. Right? There's a dynamic relationship to resources that resources are shared within the commons, the commons itself evolves, and you know, one of the intended consequences often in these communities is for there to be positive spillovers to the public. So there's often sort of internal generation sharing and then there's spillovers for the rest of the public. And again, that often is a very different set of consequences than you study in the context of natural resources. So um, I apologize for the slide. If anyone who's interested in the book, I can send this around if people are interested. Um, in fact, the next slide just says, don't worry, too much text, just no destruction. But I'll keep it for a second in case you're interested. What we've done is we've identified the most general set of variables that, could, that should be used to analyze all types of settings we think are relevant for the framework. We've divided the investigation of the variables, the groups of questions, summarized by this outline. Um, I want to say about this outline, it seems like a lot of text. It's a lot of text for a slide, but it's not a lot of text for a research framework. Right? So um, we worked really hard when we were on, when we were developing the framework for the book to boil down the set of questions a case study author, scholar might employ um, to sort of a one pager. So this is in a sense like a one pager that summarized like the kinds of different angles and perspectives and sets of questions. But the rest of chapter one in the book like breaks all this out in detail and sort of explains what we mean and sort of different kinds of questions and whatnot. Um, uh, so even though it's a, it's, a, it's a bad slide for presentation purposes, I want you to see that, 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 that it actually is sort of a one pager that kind of summarizes the kinds of things you'd be looking at. Um, another thing about a framework approach, this was true for Ostrom, it's true for us, is the framework's uh, going to change over time. Frameworks are meant to be fle flexible in the sense that you learn as you study, and sometimes you figure, so for example, and I'll say this in a second, the conclusion, we figured out that there are some questions we think should be asked when you're doing a case study that originally we hadn't anticipated, but they, it popped up in all of the 11 case studies that are in the book, and so we said, okay, well, it seems, this seems to be important, so we, we added the question back into the framework. Um, key thing about, uh, so don't worry about this note structure approach. Okay, so here's the, you read, see that? That's yes. it's just the table of contents for the book, or the chapters in the book. Besides the, in the chapter one is sort of the big framework and theory chapter. But these are the case study uh, chapters out there. So Dan Cole and Yokai Benkler wrote two great theory papers situating what we're doing in the existing literature. So Dan Cole situates our project within Eleanor Ostrom's world, her project. Um, and Yokai uh, has a wonderful chapter. Um, where he situates our work in the infrastructure, really connects it with infrastructure and public access commons more generally. Um, the, uh, then we've got a, a range of different cases. So that it's interdisciplinary. I just want to say, like, who's doing the work? We've got some law professors. We've got a Bureau of Labor economist, uh, anthropologist, historian, um, uh, computer science. Um, what am I forgetting? No, so I, I think I think maybe this is astronomist. What's that? Astronomists. Uh, astronomical data. Oh, astronomical data. Well, that's Mike Madison's a law professor. But it's a, in terms of the backgrounds of the people doing the studies, I mean, it's a bunch of people from different disciplines. So it's meant to be bringing people in who are interested in these kinds of things. Um, the uh, range of things that were studied is also interesting, right? In a sense, this is a proof of concept for the, the applicability of the framework. Is it is it general enough and still useful? Right, and uh, you know, we think it was the gene data, rare disease research consortium. I'm going to talk about my case study with Kathy and uh, Chun, uh, which focuses on rare disease research consortium. What is roller derby names? Roller derby names, the names of the of the of the women in the roller derby league. We don't, I don't know what is it. Roller derby. Roller, de uh, roller derby. I don't have a picture. Roller derbies are the roller derby is a sort of sport where you're on roller skates. Uh, we're on roller skates and they're going around. I don't know how to describe it very well for you. Okay, so look it up after. That's a project, okay? But so it's interesting. That, that what's interesting is the last two, roller derby names and then Congress, a legislative body. Funny is reading the annual report for, for tomorrow, the Nexus Center meeting tomorrow, um, I'm trying to remember which one of the projects you are on was 
focused on legislative open data coming out of legislative bodies, right? Uh, so we thought, oh, this is, who would think of Congress as a knowledge commons? In fact, in this case study, usefully applies the framework and sort of thinks about Congress as a knowledge commons because they actually do have a construct bunch of members who share information in different communities, not just the legislator, who's their staff and others. And they're sharing knowledge, some of which is all internal and not released to the public, and some of which is made public. Um, and we found that quite interesting. It turns out you guys are also sort of onto this that, you know, uh, there are other knowledge commons you might not think of as knowledge commons. Um, so, like, and then, so we've got the, the gene data, the research stuff, astro astronomical data is, is actually a citizen uh, 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 participation project, right? Uh, so you've got a bunch of, uh, like my kid, my seven year old contributed to Galaxy Zoo. Um, it's, sort of, it's, it's very interesting. Um, open source software, um, online creation of these, user innovation, these are also a lot of their classic things. The airplane invention is a historical one. Um, journalism and military technology, also historical in nature. Really, in, really interesting history, uh, uh, historian plus interesting project to the, the, the case. You study. know what you miss? Illegal almost. That's the next conference, maybe. Yeah, I think that we are very expert on illegal commons in this country, and uh, oh, other are. countries are also good. And I think that there is a lot to learn from this kind of cartels. Cartels well, are common. I was thinking about mafia, about uh, crime. I was thinking about uh, drug rings. Look, if you want to do, if Next to Center wants to sponsor, uh, uh, bring a bunch, bunch of scholars to use our framework to do case studies on knowledge commons and criminal, criminal knowledge commons. Biker gangs, criminal gang, gangs in, uh, in, in prisons, prison yeah. gangs, uh, mafia, cartel. A cartel is a knowledge commons in the sense that they have to share pricing information, on output information. They've got to share knowledge within a certain community. They certainly don't want to share that same information with the world. Right. right? So not all commons are good. Some commons are bad. But institutionally, study how their institutions work. You can still learn interesting lessons sure. about the institutional structure. Um, employed by members of the group, even if their like objectives are socially detrimental. Right? That, that's great. Well, so look, one of the this is the future bullet point, but well, I'll just say it now. The way this bigger project is working, and so we had a <coughs> we had a conference at NYU um, uh, in uh, 2010. Ostrom was the keynote. We had, we had all these authors come and present their initial case studies at early stages. Um, and then the outcome from that conference is this book. We had a medical research commons conference at NYU uh, earlier this spring. It involved user innovation community and, and a bunch of others um, studying medical research. That will produce another book probably in a year and a half to two years. And we're already thinking about, well, what's the next set of conferences? So the, so the model is conference bringing together about two dozen people, you know, some of which are doing case, you know, a good chunk of which are doing case studies, but not all of which are doing case studies. Do a bunch of case studies that turns into an edited volume that usefully collects and aggregates and analyzes a set of case studies. And then we want to be able to code them and put them eventually into a big database so that we can, you know, my goal in 15, this is why I was saying I'll do this for the next 10 or 15 years. My goal is in 10 years to have 200 case studies or more, but in 200 case studies and then be able to do some quantitative analysis and, and you know and, and sort of doing some work uh, generalizing from those case studies. Of course that requires I can't do that alone. The, the, the project is the idea. So so we've been mapping out different ones, you know, I, I actually like that. The other one that someone came up with last time I presented this was uh, spiritual, religious, folklore, cop, knowledge challenge, which is another easy intro. I mean, you could think of like uh, any you take your religion in a sense, it's often a, man, a knowledge, managed knowledge commons. A certain way. Members get access to certain knowledge and not understand all that stuff. Let me, let me keep going so I can get, get, I'll get through this. I don't know, how, how are we doing on time? We have plenty of time, right? This is a little longer. Okay. So let me just, hi, uh, before I go to the case study, because um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the case study that I did where disease research consortium. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the themes, some of the things we drew out of in the conclusion from this book. <laughs> They're grouped in, um, in this manner. So, some of the themes. I, I want to be very clear, and I was, I'm so careful, I was very careful about this and with my co authors that we can't, we don't have enough data to generalize at all. So I, can't, I can't say anything meaningful. Like, so I, I was interviewing, uh, I don't want to say which journalist, but a, a very, I'm trying to get it reviewed in the very top 
like not uh, I'm trying to do science too, but like a place like science. And the guy the guy I was talking to says, well, this is really really fascinating, interesting. So what are the what are the policy relevant outcomes that you can tell me now? Let me change. I said none. Who's the bitch? I said none. And he said, well, no, really, but no, really, I, I need to know what can we say that'll change it? Nothing. Not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play the game of pretending that based on this book and based on the limited set of case you saw the list of limited set of case studies that I can come up with some immediate policy based recommendation. It doesn't that's not how it works. Right? What I can say is proof of concept. And what I can also say in terms of the framework, that like this is a good way to study commons, it seems like. Um, I can say that, you know, there are co there are knowledge commons where you wouldn't expect to find them. What would be released? You know, they're, they're, they're more, they're out there more than you might think. So they might be less exceptional than you think. And maybe they're even more. In other words, they're all around. They're part of how we produce information on a regular basis. But, you know, I, I don't want to even go too far that way. You know, so I'm very, I want to be very careful about what I general, generalize too soon. But here are some themes that we observed, observations we made from, study, from these case studies and, and editing other people's case studies. So it's, uh, you learn a lot when you edit. You know, it does of other people's studies. Um, first one jumps out. This may, you know, in those of you who study knowledge and, uh, systems, this may not be surprising, but, you know, people who get together and try to figure out how to share information or knowledge um, um, in a sustainable way face much more than just free rider. They do face free rider problems, by the way. Sometimes free rider does crop up as a real issue. So how are we going to get people to participate their fair share? And it's certainly an issue, but it's not the only a lot of that. It's coordination dilemmas across distances. Uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, dilemmas about sort of uh, uh, obstacles to getting people to trust each other. Not, be, not really because of free riding. I don't know this guy, so I don't really know that this is the group I want to be a part of. Um, there's just a whole host of dilemmas above and beyond just a simple free riding problem. Um, information asymmetries, sort of uh, sustained uh, inclusion. How do we grow memberships? I don't know if that's an issue they want to confront. So, um, so that's one theme that sort of popped out to us, um, which in part sort of is driven in the framework itself by asking about as many resources and as many, you know, describing the resources of the community members in a broad sense and thinking about the goals and objectives that people have when they decide to cooperate this way. But oftentimes people, when they decide to have goals and they want to cooperate with each other, they face certain obstacles and that's what gives rise to the demand for institutions. It gives rise to the demand for institutions that people sort of figure out ways to structure their, their relationships through institutions that allow them to overcome those dilemmas. So that this is why that's sort of the dynamic nature of saying what the resources the community members are and that's sort of figuring out the action and kind of going in this kind of a bit of a loop. Um, uh, this isn't surprising. I'll show you a graph in the case. So some of these I'll illustrate through my case study, but the uh, their complexness. And so a lot of times knowledge commons, it's it's hard to you want to just focus on the particular community, like the academic community, and you look at a bunch of academic researchers and talk about how they share information. But you've got to realize, if you're, if you're talking about biologists, biologists in an, an, an academic community um, uh, might form their own knowledge commons. You want to study it very carefully. But that, that's nested within a broader research environment. And it's nested within an uh, a, a, a engineering school, perhaps, or, or a science department, which itself is nested within a university, which itself is nested in the broader sort of a, a researcher community that crosses a bunch of different universities. Right, so thinking about the ways in which these knowledge commons in these communities are nested in broader systems is, is quite important and interesting, it turns out. <laughs> One thing that jumped out across a bunch of these different studies is, and this shouldn't, it didn't surprise me at all, but um, I don't know why it wasn't in the framework in the first place, um, is that many of these kind of shared infrastructure. Right, a lot of times you need you know, basic standard protocols, sometimes you need a central database that everyone can have access to, sometimes it's just having a biostatistician who serves as a you know, serves everyone in the community equally, right? And so there's different things, different, and it's different across the uh, the different studies. But having sort of a shared shared infrastructure all enables people to sort of structure and build these commons. Um, overall, you know, informal governance should be surprising, but a lot of a lot of the ones that we saw focused on you know really trusted leaders, like very good leaders who play well, at least in some of the case studies. 
Uh, so in the future, we that's something we're thinking about doing it. its own little study on like leadership in commons or something. Would be something that would cut across a bunch of different case studies. Um, they, they evolve over time. These are some of these led to changing the framework, like asking questions about evolution over time. Um, and then the sixth uh, theme, which connects with the broader literature in innovation economics and intellectual property, a lot of people are sort of studying this in different ways. How when people produce information and share information, there's many motivations. It's not always pecuniary, right? There's a lot of different things that motivate us to share our ideas and share our information and, and, and to create information. And you know, oftentimes that's why the free rider might not be relevant. Right? I generate a lot of information. I don't really think, really think about the free rider dilemma. It doesn't play much of a role in, or as a risk that confronts me. Uh, I'm motivated by other things. Right? I'm, I'm motivated by you know, reputational things or uh, just the, the desire to share information. Or, and as I'll say in my case study, you know, because I'm a pediatrician, the real thing I care about, I mean, I could have made more money being a different kind of doctor. One of the guys I interviewed said, he said, look, I care about money. I wouldn't be a pediatrician. I'd make a ton more money. And I could have. I was in a position where I could have been a heart surgeon. I could have done this. I made a lot more. I chose to be a pediatrician because I want to help kids who are dying. And I think rare disease research, you know, help children who otherwise have terrible lives or die. That's what I do what I do. It has nothing to do with money. You know, and so he's very like powerful. When we're interviewing about this, we're like, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. You know, we believe you. But he's like, you know, it's, what I do is just not about that. Um, and then, you know, this came up a bunch. Right? There's this mixed motivation. And, and even in that group, there's others who are motivated uh, by competition, rivalry in terms of like, you know, having a good reputation, and it's a rivalry for grant funding. Sometimes leads to competition among people within the commons. And yet there's other motivations that they to, to share with each other and cooperate. So it's these mixed, mixed motivations was a key. <coughs> um, let me just take a sip. You guys can look at this slide for a second. The, um, we also took a little time in the conclusion of the book to sort of step back and sort of think about the framework itself. Ostrom suggested, we, we sort of talked to Ostrom before she passed away, we were sort of talking about the ideas when we were developing this, we talked with her about it. one of the things she said is like, you know, it's important to always kind of be asking yourself about the framework. Apart from the studies and questions, sort of step back and think about the framework and how it worked for you and people using it and stuff like that. Um, and it turned out like we were, you know, we thought it was interesting to see that it was applied usefully to the broad, to some of the fringe examples. Um, it's incredibly important to focus on a broad range of resources. Like I said with the patent pool example, the relevant set of resources shared with the patent pool is much more than just inventions and patent licenses. Right? There's other things, tacit knowledge, other kinds of information. And when you're talking with people about the kinds of things they talk, wait, what is it you guys talk about when you get together? Right? You don't necessarily say, like, what are the resources that you share? Because then they describe it a certain way. But if you ask them the question about, like, you know, when you guys get oh, you guys get together, and like when you do, what do you talk about? And you find out they talk about things other than just you know, what's the latest invention that you have to? And can I get a license? And in other words, but my point being, there's a, there's a variety of different resources that end up mattering to people. Um, and there's a variety of different participants, right, that play, lawyers play roles in patent pools. Secretaries and administrative assistants play, I and mean, there's, there's other people who play roles that you might not pay attention to if you only zero in on who you think is the key actor. So that is not seem to be important. Um, evolution. Fourth one is think about the goals and objectives up front when you're doing your case study because that helps and then when you're talking to people like, that'll help you to identify the sort of action areas, the things that people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis that affects their ability to cooperate. Um, and then the fifth one I've already sort of touched on so I'll skip past it. The future, anyone who's interested by the way, it may be too late to get an abstract in but it'd be great to attend if you're interested at NYU the International Association for the Study of Commons is having a meeting on Knowledge Commons at NYU in September. So I'm on, the, I'm on the steering committee or whatever the name of the, you know, the committee is that's in charge of it. But uh, Captain Strandberg's running it. So this is going to be a, a big workshop focused on Knowledge Commons. Um, we have a website, uh, workshop. if you look up Workshop Knowledge Commons, you'll find it. Workshop on the Study of Knowledge Commons, where we're sort of starting to aggregate resources and whatnot. And here's the thing we're thinking about the teacher uh, to do. Um, and again, I think it's sort of, uh, to some degree, we're always trying to bring more people into, you know, taking a slow, steady, systematic approach to studying such things. Um, 
All right, I'm going to take a break for like a minute or 30 seconds and uh, let my voice rest while I take a little sip. You guys, anyone have any questions or thoughts at, about the at the first part before I sort of talk about the case study itself? Um, just let me mention that at the law school we have uh, quite a lot of works by Elena Ostrom, if you're interested. Uh, and uh, especially I would uh, encourage you to read uh, the book uh, which Brett mentioned by Elena Ostrom and uh, Caroline Hess. Is Caroline or Catherine? Sure. Charlotte Hess. Charlene Hess. About the information commons. So, <laughs> there is a lot of work available at the law school. For you learn economics tools. Any others? I'm happy to keep going. I just want to see if there's any reflections or thoughts on the generic approach or whatever. All right, I'll keep going. Uh, go, go ahead with the case study. Probably four, we have till six, right? So I'll probably talk about another 10, 10 to 15. And we have time to do five, right? Five. 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 Or, yeah, we'll get five. Till five. So I'll go for another ten or fifteen minutes. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. So Kathy Spanberg and I are um, did a case study on the Recycle Disorder Consortium. It's one of the chapters in the book. We're currently starting in the property, you know, public document review. I'll show you a slide in a second about like our methodology. We're going through that methodology with the first stages for the second, the Angel and Rhett Crater Willy Syndrome Consortium. We're hoping to do more. In fact, we want to get an NIH grant to sort of basically systematically study rare disease research consortium as commons and study a, a large number of them. Um, there are a number in Europe, too, because it's a huge rare disease research consortium is a very big international phenomenon, so actually there's opportunities for people here, anyone here is happens to be interested in rare disease research as, as a knowledge of studying it. Um, we do stuff over here as well. In fact, some of the people we interviewed were for the UCDC were European, you know, European folks. All right, so um, why rare disease research research? First, let me talk about rare diseases um, for a second. I'll be quick on this. Um, so in addition to the classic sort of public goods problem, the fact that we're producing research, we're producing information, in public goods kind of story, right? Um, and even all of the, the general problems is just research systems. You know, rare diseases face some of their own specific special problems, common to different kinds of rare diseases, right? So one is that there's few patients per disease, right? So uh, in the U.S., we def it's defined differently in Europe and the U.S. It doesn't really matter that much. But the point is. The U.S. is defined by statutes less than 200,000 people uh, that have the disease. Often there's only a few thousand globally. One of the, the urea cycle disorder consortium, one of the disorders has only six people in the United States known to have the disorder. Right? So it can range quite a bit. Um, what does that mean? Well, on one hand, it means there's no blockbuster pharma profits. In other words, pharma companies aren't like jumping into the rare disease research drug development program to develop huge huge amounts of money. In other words, the mark demand is small. Um, another consequence of it being a rare disease is that patients tend to be geographically scattered. Right? So there's, I mean, if you imagine a six, you don't have to go that long, so you imagine a couple hundred people scattered all across the United States that have the disease. Right? It's hard to bring them together to, for clinical studies, to, do, to participate in, in, in clinical studies. It's hard to, gather, to bring them together to get treatment. Uh, typically, when the, when the uh, kid shows up to the pediatrician, the pediatrician has no idea what's going on, right? I've never seen this before because it's so rare. Um, head is not like they have multiple cases of the same that come in on a regular basis, right? You get, you get the point. Um, we also think what's interesting about studying rare, it might be interesting, is that um, many diseases might be rare in the future, right? So if you think about the future of personalized medicine, if treatment is increasing, you know, this may be a big data issue, I guess. I and mean, if you think about big data driving personalization of medical treatment, it may very well be the case that in the future, um, the rare disease model ends up being more broadly applicable than it currently is. So it's applicable now to things that we have identifiable rare disease. It may very well be that this model of doing research and solving these kinds of knowledge problems may actually apply to a much wider range of cases. We may learn something by studying these now. Um, so in order to make progress, 
and progress in the area of rare disease research means um, you know, developing more research and developing treatments that actually improve the health outcomes for the patients. Um, you've got to be able to recruit patients, right, to participate in studies and drug trials. Right? Um, and again, ge ge geographic scattering makes that hard. Identifying and finding them makes that hard. Right? Protocol standardization, data aggregation. you got small end studies, sometimes very small end. Right? It's very hard to do the research right, according to sort of conventional statistical or biostatistical approaches. You kind of have to develop specialized protocols and standards. You got to data, aggregate your data in certain ways. So that, that raises some challenges. Um, you also have to get widely scattered researchers to cooperate. In other words, they're not. Uh, the, pedi the pediatrician is providing treatment in uh, the middle of Iowa, right, um, uh, may not. You got to encourage them to participate in the research program that that the center of which may be in Washington D.C. Right, so you have to sort of get people from abroad to be able to cooperate. <coughs> um, so the NIH uh, in, in 2003 established the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network, um, uh, the RDCRN. Um, what it does is it uh, it gives out grants about one one point two five million per year. So that's that's a, that's a small amount of money for you know, for medical research, um, but it's for organizational and institutional issues, right? So it's money to help facilitate the coordination that we're going to be examining. Um, as there's nineteen consortia, this is going to change. The third round RFA round of funding just got they just evaluated the proposals like a month ago, and so they should be coming out soon. So I'm not sure. It was 19 as of yeah, six months ago. Um, and the RDCRN established as a goal for the network, oh, I'm sorry, before I jump, consider though that there are thousands of rare, you know, two to five, depending on how the numbers, it's about two to five thousand rare diseases. There's only 19 consortia that are spot, you know, that are in these, uh, in the RDCRN. So one way to think about what the NIH is doing is, on the bottom line, is establish shared resources for rare disease and treatment and nurses that like a pilot study in institutional design. But if they can figure out how to make it work for these 19 and gradually grow, maybe that's something that we can apply to the broader uh, arena. Um, but four methods, overcome these various obstacles, and sort of this sort of a, you know, a test bed in a sense. And of course, their primary goal is to, serve, is to help the patients in these 19 groups. It's not like, I mean, no one we talked about was you know, we're glad we participated in a pilot, in pilot project in institutional design. No, they're, they're, they want to help the children. That's the, the, their patients. But the NIH is thinking about both things. Right? They can think of both levels. Um, again, why are we, so why are we studying the RDCRN? We think it's pretty, it's obviously just important because of what they do, but we think it's a pretty good test bed for the overarching framework, framework and uh, methodology, in part because you've got a bunch of different consortia to compare. Some of which are in the in the RDCRN, many of which are not. There are some that were denied, you know, their grant proposals were denied in round one or round two. We'll see about round three. There's some that were in round one but not in round two. So you're going to have some variation in terms of success as evaluated by the by the uh, peer review committee at, uh, at, at the NIH. You're going to have they're all facing similar kinds of knowledge production and sharing problems. Um, um, and so we eventually could, you know, maybe we'll have to wait 10 years to be able to do some comparative work. We might be able to do some comparative work a little earlier if we could get 25 to 30 or maybe less studies of these rare disease research consortia because they're similarly structured. Um, and then there's also, it's interesting for this nested structure, which I'll show you in a, in a, in a picture in just a second. Um, so we did one in-depth study. We're starting our second. We're planning to do more. Um, this is sort of just one project that will be ongoing for a while. Um, so if you think about the RDCRN, it's a commons. At the most, at the macro level, I'm going to show you three things, macro, meso, micro level knowledge commons. It's interesting because you might think, like, what could I, how could I think about in your own, whatever field you're interested in, like, how could I think of these different levels of knowledge commons, right? So this is at the macro level, um, the RDCRN itself as an organization. It has a bunch of members in their community, the members being the different rare disease research consortium themselves. They're all members of the RDCRN. 
Another member is the Coalition of Patient Advocacy Groups. So if there's each of these consortia has one or more, often more, patient advocacy, advocacy groups, so, you know, which are uh, uh, often sort of run by parents of people with the diseases. And so there's a separate group, patient advocacy group, um, that advocates on behalf of the patients with regard to legislative and you know, interact. They're quite, they turn out to be quite important. Um, but the coalition is sort of the representatives for all the different patient advocacy groups. They have their own group, right, that has representation at the RATCR and they, they vote on the steering committee that they, they participate. The NIH Office of Rare Disease Research, <coughs> the Data Management Coordination Center, which is at, I think it's South Florida now, um, uh, house the database and a bunch of the data infrastructure. And all of the all of the different member consortia get access to the uh, infrastructure provided by the DMCC. Right? They, the DMCC helps them to sort of develop their protocols and whatnot, shares information that way. Um, now we don't really study. We talk about this a bunch to give you a, a sense of context. But we study, as it says, zoom in here, we zoom in on the UCDC, and again we see at the consortium or the meso level, you see another knowledge conference. Right? Again, institutionalized sharing arrangement among members of a community in the sharing of the relevant resources and knowledge resources. Here, the members include all of the different clinical research sites. So now we, now we just have one rare disease, like the UCD, urea cycle disorder consortium. Excuse me. There's clinical research sites spread out around the country at different hospitals and university, university hospitals around the country. Right? They are their team there is a member of this knowledge commons of the consortium itself. Um, you've got consortium PIs the so UCDC. They're at uh, they're in DC at the uh, Children's Hospital in DC. The other consortium are elsewhere. Um, again, the patient advocacy group is a member of the consortium. Right? The, Cynthia Lamont, who's the head of the UCDC case study. Uh, votes on the steering committee. She actively engaged in sort of research protocol, protocol development. She's actively engaged in communicating ongoing studies to patients, and vice versa. Um, she's a member of the knowledge conference in a, in a very important way. Um, there's people like study coordinator. The study coordinator for the for the whole Barrel consortium was also at Children's Hospital in DC for the UCDC example. Um, played an incredibly important role in facilitating cooperation of all the different members. Um, they have a role in training. I'm going to jump a slide for just a second. So at, at a given, this is the micro level. If you're looking at a particular clinical research, uh, at a particular clinical research site, you know there's a site coordinator, typically someone with like a master's degree. They're not doctors. They're not researchers. They're like a master's degree, and they're sort of incredibly important in maintaining the connection between patients and ongoing studies, in particular in the longitudinal study um, and in the survey. So stuff we did it turned out to be a very important piece of the puzzle in terms of facilitating cooperation. Now, the site coordinators, the study coordinator not only coordinates the study, but has a role in terms of uh, mediating relationships with the site coordinators at each of the different. Uh, right. There is something which I am missing, maybe others are missing, or maybe I just uh, lost something. In which way is it nested? You're saying that this is a nested structure. In which way? Yes, but why? Why? Um, nested only in the sense that each of, each of the they're all, all of the uh, um, each, each of the art the research consortia are completely sort of uh, their institutional structures are nest part of a broader network at the, at the higher level, right? And so um, you've sort of got nodes in a network in a sense that sort of flow down to that level, and then again the same thing happens uh, at, the, at the more micro level. Each of them is sort of situated; its rules and its governance are sort of affected. As you, as you work its way down. When, when we're and it's talking its about the, the, the biologists uh, who are nested in to a wider structure of university, which universities, right. then, it was clear in which way does this apply to this? Uh, oh, well, it's this is all of it. And so in the case study, we break down, for the UCDC one, for example, we break down a bunch of different environments within which the broadest, the RDCRN itself is nested, right? So the RDCRN is nested in the broader medical research, it's rested within NIH, right, NIH and the this broader understand. medical research environment, right? Okay. But even when you zoom in and focus in on just the RDCRN, right, it has its own knowledge common structure, it shares knowledge with a bunch of institutions that allow them to do that, it overcomes certain dilemmas to get people to cooperate, right? Um, but then even nested within that, you've got another set 
of knowledge commons. Okay, I'm getting almost clear. Yeah, yeah. Thank it's you. just that there's a continuum, there's a set of relationships okay. that, that flows. Um, you know, you could think of network, you could think of hierarchy, there's different words you could use to describe what I mean, sort of the nested structure. I just mean that one sits within the other, you know, the other okay. and zero. Um, and, you know, Ostrom described it this way uh, in one of her papers about the importance of identifying and studying the nested structure of knowledge, of just commons in general. I think she used Google Maps. Like, you can zoom in. If you look at it at one level, and you can understand the research and understand what's going on, then you can zero, zoom in, and then you can look at a town, and you see all of, all of its intricate details and operations. From another, and then, boom, you can zoom in again. And that ability to zoom in and zoom out and have interconnected relationships between different levels um, is important, right? And it's different than studying any one of them in isolation. Right? So you got to the study of the UCDC consortium, it's incredibly important that it is, in fact, nested in this broader institutional structure. And in fact, the RDCRN, the NIH, requires certain features, institutions, that exist in the, each and every consortium. Right, so it has, a, it has a broad impact on how it functions. Um, I'll be quick on the, the methodology. Um, so we did a huge literature review of all, all the uh, publicly available documents about the UCDC, um, but then we also got access to all of their internal, their internal documents, their, their policies, data use policy, uh, intellectual property policy, their industry agreements with industry like pharma, look at the minutes of their meetings, um, we did 16, about, I forgot the length, about 85 minutes on average uh, in terms of the interviews uh, with, you know, the NIH, some NIH officials, the PI, uh, the head of the Children's Hospital in D.C., a lawyer that represents the UCDC, um, pharma representative from a small pharma company that works with them. Uh, we attended their annual consortium meeting. This was pretty amazing, actually. So we went to their, uh, they have a meeting, two-day meeting every year in Washington, D.C., uh, the first day, which is a res all the researchers present research. And one thing interesting about include uh, so slides, but I mean, one of the interesting things is like the you know, the one of the pharma company uh, people presented research at the you know the UCDC research meeting, you know, showing that there really are they're a part of the community. Um, the uh, patient advocacy group uh, 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 person was there attending. Uh, the head of the patient advocacy group was attending the researcher meeting. The second day of the meeting um, was patient advocacy group sponsored it. All the patients and families, a bunch of patients and families were there, and the researchers made presentations of the existing state of the research and, and studies to all the patients. So the patients and their families are incredibly sophisticated in terms of understanding and, and like the latest stage of the research that, that, their, that their kids and, and that they're subject to. And then, you know, so we were there, and, you know, we we're just observers, so we kind of did quiet, not really getting involved. But you know, you can help, but like at the reception at you know, at the lunch or whatever at the patient advocacy meeting, you know, the researcher knows on a first name basis with the, the you know, the husband and wife and the kids and they all come up and they're hugging and you know, they're introducing us and they're hugging us and it's like, you know, they, there's this, this feeling of inclusion and sort of everyone knows each other and sort of building the community was a really important, tangible thing that you really we would never have known if we hadn't have been there, if we hadn't gone and seen it. You know what I mean? It's just a different, you know, they describe it somewhat when you interview them, but you only get a sense of it when you actually see it in, in, in practice. And then we did a, a, a survey. We surveyed a small number, but everyone. I mean, not everyone said, yeah, you know, answered the survey, but we sent out a survey to everyone in the consortium. I think we, I forgot the number, 80 something. We got a, a decent number of response, uh, responses. Um, all right. In terms of analysis uh, of some, you know, so again, we identified an incredibly wide range of resources uh, and outcomes that people identified as being relevant to what their uh, action is and their everyday practice. Um, and some of the things that required management were scarce. So it turns out when you think about the framework too, it's not just knowledge, it's rivalrous and non-rivalrous resources that you really want to pay attention to because they present different governance challenges for these communities. So, you know, funding and how it's allocated, you know, thinking about the patients themselves, not only as people you're trying to help, but in a sense they talk about them at times like their resources, because they are, because their data is an essential input to doing the research that they're doing. 
But of course, that raises the standard sort of uh, IRB type stuff that you know the ethical issues you have to think about. Um, the data management coordinating center with the standardization of protocols of the data managed the database. Um, you know, just the basic knowledge about the disease is very important for them to communicate that. Like, like I said, at the, at the second data meeting, to the patients and the families and to each other, uh, but also with an outward-facing website. Um, and then there's the standard stuff we tend to think about, like publications, drugs, data, <coughs> uh, and so on. The, again, we talk in the paper quite a bit. There's a lot of different actors that play critical roles. It's not just a bunch of researchers doing research on their own. Um, there are MD PhD researchers, and they're quite important, obviously. Um, but it's also important in terms of their identities that they're not just researchers. They're also pediatricians. A lot of them emphasize that aspect of who they were uh, in terms of why they do what they do. Um, uh, it, it would also, during the interviews, the in-person interviews, and also through the, the survey, we asked some follow-up questions to sort of test this out a little bit. Um, you know, the importance of study, study PIs and site PIs. Many people emphasize that the whole thing wouldn't work if you didn't have these folks sort of managing the relationships with patients because patients wouldn't come back. Right? They'd come in once and then you, you wouldn't see them again, especially for the longitudinal study. Um, the, uh, oh, the patients, obviously. The patient advocacy group. And there's a bunch of nice, really interesting quotes from the NIH, the head of the Office of Rare Disease Research, Steve Groff, about how you know none of this would work out. Patient advocacy group. We need the patient advocacy group involved, both in terms of connecting patients and the researchers, but also in terms of uh, they advocate for different kind of advocate for different kinds of research to be done. Um, there's also understanding that patients' tolerance for risk in rare disease communities is a little different than it often is in normal research, medical research communities. In other words, since there's so few treatments out there, they're willing to, um, to take greater risks in a sense. And so that it, that communication was, was was something that the patient advocacy played a role in. And again, that's, that's knowledge exchange about like risk preferences of the patient population to the NIH and also to the, uh, to the researchers and, and, and doctors. Um, a lot of different action situations. Um, the longitudinal study seemed to be, and I'll, this, this will come out later, seemed to be the most important. It was required by the NIH. It seems to be the most important in the sense that it's the glue that seems to hold everyone together, as well as the low cost way of doing research. Right? Low cost in terms of patient participation, low cost in terms of researchers participating. Um, the man managing the data set itself is done by the DMCC, so you have the infrastructure to help you do that. Um, but there's a bunch of other action in the clinical trials and treatment of patients and training was very quite important, came up quite a bit, training junior researchers. Also recruiting researchers, because the, the main the, the, the consortium is mainly of sort of uh, I, I think we described it as three different generations, like the old, the older, the middle aged, and the younger, and even the middle aged are getting older, and so that one of the people we're interviewing is emphasizing this and saying we it's really important for us to keep attracting young researchers and pediatricians to sort of be interested in these things. But otherwise, when we're all retired, there's going to be no one to keep doing the research. So that was kind of a, uh, an important action arena. Um, all of this I've more or less sort of talked about, I think. So growing the community, growing the pool of research subjects and data, promoting knowledge sharing. These are, I thought maybe I did say this, but these objectives are all sort of different ways to describe the, the knowledge sharing that goes on within the community. Um, uh, the fourth one is the one where I was sort of talking a little bit about how the patient advocacy group helped cooperate with the patients in terms of setting the priority and communicating results seem to be quite important. Translating research into treatment is like a big, they all want to get some drug by pharmaceutical development, a sort of circle uh, company developed. So, um, you know, the bottom here, you know, it's, it's difficult to attract pharmacal interest. I'm going to jump past that slide. Uh, how do they overcome some of the objectives or challenges so they can achieve their objectives? Well, the, uh, each of these has its own slides, so I'll just, I'll just go through it quickly. Um, again, as I've mentioned, in mixed motivations, right, for all pediatricians, that's the primary driver. Some express joy in collaborating and sharing knowledge with each other. That's sort of why, they, you know, why they're more than willing to participate. Uh, this helps to overcome. Now, there are coordination, free rider conflict issues about sort of who gets first author on a publication, right, and sort of there are some competitive issues about who gets the grant funding and stuff. Um, but these, uh, we think these underlying motivations help, help get over that, those issues. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the longitudinal study is one action arena that seems a, a pretty good at patient recruitment. 
low risk, low cost in a lot of ways. Uh, <coughs> depends a lot on the study coordinators kind of managing and coordination with patients. Um, it's good as a low entry to bring in lots of different clinical researchers that, that are dispersed because there's not a whole lot they have to do. So if only 6% of my time can be allocated to UCBC related stuff, I can do that relatively easily when I'm just participating in a longitudinal study. Um, uh, and then pharma, this is good. This is the important thing. Uh, they're by doing a longitudinal study of all the patients over time. The longitudinal, you guys know what a longitudinal study is. If you're saying it, I don't know what it is. The longitudinal study is sort of a study of all your the characteristics and data on your patients over over time, keeping track of them over a longer period of time. Um, and so characterizing a population of, of UCD people with UCD uh, urea cycle disorders um, over time dramatically lowers the cost for doing clinical research trials for pharma. In other words, that data set is incredibly useful, right? So one of the things that, that the NIH broadly is hoping, the RNCRN is hoping, and that these individual consortia are hoping, they're all hoping they can attract pharma because they say, look, you can, you can help develop these drugs uh, at lower cost. And in fact, there are some, uh, I think there's six you know, really small pharma companies that are actively focus on the use in, in active in the UCDC area. Um, I'll, I'll jump, I want to get to the Q&A so we have at some time to talk, so I'll just jump through this path or really past this. It turned out that, you know, everyone we interviewed overwhelmingly emphasized Mark Bapshaw, the leader of the UCDC, as being like the critical factor that made success possible. In a variety of different ways they said this during the interviews. Um, and then the second thing that I want people always came up was collegiality, right? Everyone really knows each other, get, they, they're really like each other, that some of them have known each other for years, and the people who come into the group, they're very inclusive and nice. In fact, the first night when we went to the first meeting, is one of the observations we made just sort of sitting there, is they invite us to come to their dinner before the first researcher meeting, and the first thing that, that, that Mark Bashaw gets up, and he goes around the room, and he introduces, every, introduces everybody again, and has everybody like say something interesting about themselves, and they're very warm, inviting, like no one felt like they afraid to do it, uh, and it was just, you could just tell that like if there was a certain kind of camaraderie among everyone. Uh, in part because of this, this uh, leader. Um, let's see, also a leader at the, uh, at the patient advocacy group. Similarly, both in terms of interviews and in terms of survey came up as being very important. Um, uh, yeah, so they're very inclusive and they have sort of this close knit group. Um, uh, publication policy seemed to be the only formal governance structure that mattered in the sense that, in the sense that everyone knew about it. Not every, like not all of the all of the main PIs knew about the publication policy and the details about it. <laughs> Data use policy and some of the others they didn't. They they, they didn't know about the details of the, of the governance structure uh, as much. Some did, but not all. Of them. But the publication policy everyone was familiar with it. They all sort of. Um, wanted to have a role in sort of its design and its existence. Um, and that turned up both an interview and a survey. Um, the, uh, and we thought that this in part is a good way, so there's, there's, a, there's sort of who's going to be the first author. It's all set out as publication policy. So this policy sort of sets out the rules for how you're going to allocate credit. And it's incredibly inclusive everyone, but there's also there's some publications that are like, as you see, you see on the whole, like you see like a list of 40 people or something. So it's just ways that they've dealt with that issue, or it could have been an issue. Um, we saw a couple of challenges, kind of, you know, there's going to be a leadership transition in the next few years that they all, they recognize. Um, uh, they have sort of a successor for Mike ba Mark Batshaw sort of chosen, but he's a very different person than Mark Batshaw. His, his, for example, his philosophy on patents is very different, but he has much patents from his prior, you know, from research earlier, and so that they're be talking a little bit about their, how they view patents and intellectual property. And, uh, you know, Mark Batchaw versus Marshall Summer just had different views on the role of patents in this environment. Um, uh, and there are other things about their leadership characteristics that might be, that might be different. Um, the other challenge is that they're growing, right? They need to grow, they need to have more sites, they need to bring more people in. And, and a number of people in the survey, this came up a little bit in the interviews, more in the survey, that that people recognize that as they're growing, they have a monthly teleconference call where everyone's on the call. And that's great when your numbers are small, but at some point it gets sort of unmanageable for everyone to feel like they can actually talk and participate. And they all they recognize they, they all want it to continue. They're all just keep having a monthly teleconference call because we recognize 
it's it's going to be harder for everyone to feel like they have a say in what's going on as we grow. Um, and they're going to increasingly have, I mean, they want to have relationships with pharma. In the future, they imagine, a number of them acknowledged that um, this is, this may be an issue they have to revisit. If they do, they want to, uh, a number of people said they all want to have input, right? more input than just relying on the steering committee alone. Um, and there's also, we see, the, this came really just through the interview, I think, with uh, Cindy Lamont, the head of the, the patient advocacy group, but there's potential disagreement between the patient advocacy group and the research community about patents, right? Because patients may have very, you know, they want prices as low as possible, but they also, they all know they, they really need to get patents. I mean, they may need, they all want the drugs, and if they, and if they need the, to, if the drug companies insist on having patents to induce them to, to sort of go through clinical trials and whatnot, um, it's, you know, they're, the patient advocacy group community is okay with that, except they, you know, they might care about how the price, you know, what the pricing looks like. Um, so you know, it may be that they may need more formal policies. So you know, we give you our longitudinal data to lower the cost of doing your clinical research studies in exchange. Not only do you just get a drug, which we're all hoping for, but maybe there's something they can do with prices. Um, but that was this is more a couple of conversations than sort of a, an output. So we don't really describe that in the actual uh, written out case study. Um, Look, measures of success are, are kind of tricky to evaluate. Right? Here's a bunch you might look to. Um, farm interest, treatment improvements, measure. It's hard to measure all of these things. Um, uh, let me just say that, so in terms of learning and evaluation, what we can say is the UCDC is incredibly successful according to the UCDC, according to the NIH. So in the first two rounds, the UCDC got the highest score in peer review process. That was something, right? So the UCDC meets its own goals and objectives according to itself, and it meets the goals that NIH has for it. But you know, again, we want to be very clear. We, we don't have independent evaluative criteria. We don't know would more have been done had they organized their research differently. Would less have been done? Um, are they different institutional structures? Different publication policy or different, you know, structure for giving out pilot grants to the we, we don't we don't know that, and so we are very clear that we can't draw big conclusions like that. But what we can say is they seem to be successful according to what they say according to the NIH. Um, however, and they do give us some hypotheses that we want to be able to test as we do more. Um, however, if we do more, we might learn about success measures. Again, there are the countries. There are other countries. You might uh, think about the different experiences and see whether there are ways uh, to um, assess in a comparative way success in, in your experience as opposed to Germany or oh, yeah. South America, whatever. Probably you cannot set up double uh, blinds as, uh, you, as you do in pharma research because this is the model. In the United States, you follow this model. But around the world, you can probably find. Uh, Examples which would be used to build right. uh, measurement and they, and, and they collaborate. So, in terms of the UCDC, the UCDC works with international. They have an international research yeah. site. I think Zurich is one of their has a research site that's part of the consortium. So, they collaborate with foreign researchers on UCDC stuff. Um, it is true, like the more case studies we do, eventually we'll have, I think, the ability to evaluate the success or, or lack of success of. Um, of different consortia along different metrics. It's just, well, I want to just admit that I just don't have that now. I don't want to mislead people into thinking I do. Um, we do have a bunch of hypotheses that we, you know, are drawing out of this study and that we'd like to be able to test as we go forward. Right? One, you know, one has to do it. I mean, these are pretty straightforward. Strong leadership, uh, strong study coordinator leadership, site like coordinator training. Um, after the bullet point, a little more details about the kind of characteristics that came up during the, in the survey. <coughs> uh, close to the core researcher group, right? So it matters that the UCDC, it might matter, that the UCDC is a group of researchers who knew each other before they formed the UCDC. The next one we're studying, uh, that might not be the case. Right? They may not already have had a research consortium, I'm not sure, but the point is that the existence of a close-knit researcher group prior to and after might, might affect how they function when they're sort of formalized institutions as opposed to situations where in response to an NIH grant you get a bunch of different people together. In fact, I'm pretty sure that when, I'm going to uh, really 
the, the next one we're doing is three different disorders with three different patient advocacy groups and three different groups of researchers. So I know for sure that they didn't have an initial one coordinate group. They may have three. So the question is how well do they, how well do they work versus this? And so that might be something to test over time. Um, certainly the strength of the uh, patient advocacy group is one we want to be able to uh, sort of test over time. The three in yellow are ones that were required by the RDCRN. The RDCRN suggested that they have a lot of requires that the consortia that are in their group have a longitudinal study, you know, the monthly teleconference annual gatherings are part of what's, what they asked for in the protocol standardization of the DMCC. Um, and then the formal publication policy. Things we thought were going to be important that at least, we, we're going to continue, these are still hypotheses to test, but we're just saying like in the UCDC one, we were kind of surprised that they didn't seem to be important. Um, they don't have a formal conflict resolution policy or procedure, and it didn't seem to matter because they're very collegial and they handle things on a sort of a informal basis. Um, uh, history of involvement of all CPIs in UCDC research. They, did, they said that that wasn't important, we're not sure. Um, so these are things that we, we, we thought might be important, but didn't seem to be important based on the, the, the survey and what people were saying. And then, uh, let's see, conclusions uh, from the case study. Um, I'm trying to think of things I haven't already said, so I've said a lot of this, right? There's, there's a bunch of scarce resources, rivalrous, scarce resources that need to be managed, right? not just the non-rival information stuff. Right? There are certain kinds of governance challenges that arise uh, that involve certain resources, and you want to focus on those too. Um, some need to be created, not just managed. Uh, so you got to recruit the patients. Uh, uh, the community itself is not just a thing that's governed, but you're also creating and recruiting sites and recruiting people to participate. Um, I'll skip over this next one, other than to say it's different. Um, they had a change of leadership. They have a different history. They have three different patient advocacy groups, different natural history studies instead of a longitudinal study. So there's a very, it's also very successful though. It's another one that's successful in the eyes of the NIH, but very different in terms of the things that they're doing. So we thought that would be a good next one to choose. Uh, I think that's my last slide. That's my last slide. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Waste of time. Waste of time. Policy I bored you guys to death, or you guys are all like. Apart from the data, I mean, they want to pass from the descriptive to the descriptive level. Apart from the data, you don't think that some of the elements that emerge. Uh, emerge from the study, this study, like your security in a way, like the strong leadership, for example, yeah. which is something that emerges that cannot be uh, reproduced, you know, from uh, a top down uh, you know, perspective. So, what do you think about I think that's a great. I think that's a great point. Um, you can't. Uh, you can't have a requirement that your leaders be strong. Right? <laughs> the NIH. The NIH can't. We're only going to grant to a strong leader because how would they assess the value? But it does mean that when you are forming a group, right, you can sort of think about the kind and this is what we we don't have this, we tried to do a little bit of it with the, the survey. Uh, try to figure out what are the characteristics that make a good leader. There's a lot of other research in the business management side that does that. I'm not sure that anyone carries that over to something. I'm sure people do the nonprofit sector. I'm not sure if people translate it even further to the sort of this knowledge kind of sector. Um, uh, but yeah, th there are things that are idiosyncratic about the groups, right? And there may be successful consortia, might turn out there's successful consortia that have really bad leaders, right? Or that have mediocre leaders, but nonetheless have other strengths. Um, but it did, it, you know, for this particular case study, I mean, it was just so overwhelmingly emphasized in all 18 interviews the one particular individual's leadership capabilities. Um, you know, in, in a question that wasn't at all leading, it was a question that we might have said, like, you know, if you're thinking about the characteristics that affect how successful you, you know, how you guys cooperate are successful, um, you know, what kinds of things matter, you know, like funding, you know, we might, we might list five things and we might list different orders, 
were saying it just to sort of see how people react. But overwhelmingly, leadership would be number one. And oftentimes, prior to that question even coming up, someone would have already been able to say, Mark Batshaw is like, you know, making this happen. Um, but you're right, that's, uh, uh, which is, look, that's why I don't, think, I'm not going to be prescriptive about design of these things for quite a while, right? Um, uh, you could read through these case, all 11 case studies, and you might be able to say, hey, if it's an obvious thing, it seems to me that this is more or less, the, you know, then you can try it. Um, but as a person who's uh, taking a, trying to take a scientific approach to it, right, I'm just careful to not, you know, to sort of give prescriptions about the time. Um, but a lot of these things, too, actually connect up with Al Osterman's existing work, too, right? And the idea that, and, and other work, like the idea that strong leadership matters for cooperation of organizations, right? That's true in firms, and it's true in all kinds of uh, situations. So some of the things, too, are not surprising. We just kind of connect with what we already seem to know about you know, group collaboration. So you saw that slide, and I didn't say anything about it. The hierarchical democracy is a, is a term that we use somewhere in here that uh, Kathy, actually, Kathy Strander uh, emphasized in our conversations. Let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, so what we mean by this, uh, this is sort of our way of trying to understand the two bottom bullet points. So we did a survey, and, and um, people said, you know, UC decisions are made made by leadership by the leadership, and they're hierarchical. And then they also said they're made by consensus and by majority vote. And those seem seem to be like they potentially could be in conflict. Well, what do you mean? How could they be? If they're made by the leadership and it's hierarchical, then it seems like. It's not consensus or majority vote, right? But the but what we observe, I mean, so here's so when we were at the, one of the meetings and they were calling, they're they're calling for votes on things on the first day. I mean, Kathy and I, we we're pretty sure that people were raising their hands weren't all necessarily PI. I mean, it just seemed like there was like a call of hands and those people PI and they would raise their hand. Um, it wasn't clear that it was a really important thing that they were voting on. So when we talked to people about that they said, well, look, you know, most of the decisions are, you know, they're made by consensus. People more or less agree on what we're doing. And I said, well, what about when they're not? And there are examples. We talked about a couple of them in the chapter. Uh, like there was a decision about whether to include another disease in the, to bring it in. I forgot. I, I'm going to say it. Acidosis. I'm going to say it wrong. So a disease um, into the group, and uh, patient advocacy group didn't want it. Because they said you're going to, it's going to dilute your attention and resources in ways that we don't like, uh, and a big, I think a, a majority of the people in the consortium didn't, but there were one or two. I mean, there were a minority of people did, and there were one or two. I think one of the lead PIs and you know really did want to do it, and so they had a debate and they argued about it, and it was very loud, and you know, they had their big debate, but at the end of the day, sort of that was the one where the majority kind of went out, and eventually everyone kind of, it, it kind of got to the point where it's more or less consensus that we're not going to go that route. Um, and so it's not, they don't have a formal voting system, right? Um, and so it's, you know, it, and the other thing that people said about sort of decision making is the vast majority are made by the by Mark Batchel. So we just can figure out this like the hierarchy is actually just like uh, zooming in and out as you said before by zooming uh, in and out of the uh, micro uh meso and the micro level just Well some of the yeah, so some of the governance is sort of required top down from the NIH. Um, oh and what did it you know, I didn't say it, I'm surprised I didn't say this. How did I say this earlier about 
this, another interesting part. <laughs> it's full side point, but so the NIH requires something. The DMCC, you know, in terms of protocol standardization, right, they manage, they have certain rules about doing protocols and stuff, but they, they sort of hierarchically push down on everyone below. Um, and then a lot of the bottom-up bottom decision-making, how to allocate funds to different you know, junior researchers when there's a limited pot of money, right? Um, that's more or less paid by the lead, the, the lead PIs, Mark Batshaw and the group. Um, so they have some policies for resolving some of the most parties. Mark Batshaw is such a strong leader that he more or less go along with his view. And he does it in a very sort of group, let's gather the information to run for you. What I wanted to say about this slide that I didn't mention, um, but it's, it's really interesting, I think, is notice that at the, to the right, at the 1 and 2 o'clock spots, there's NIH science officer and NIH project officer. So there's two NIH employees who are members of the consortium, members in the sense that the science officer does science with the researchers and, the, and, and reviews their protocols and helps them write grants. It made the project, it made the project officers want to help with the grant writing and, and oversees administering other grants and stuff. In other words, they are true members active with them. Right? There's not any kind of hierarchical relationship at all in that regard, even though in other regard, in other ways they are, which is kind of interesting. So it's, a, it's called a U54 grant, so it's a cooperative arrangement between the NIH and the consortium. It's sort of a way to get um, the NIH sort of directly involved in sort of this collaborative, uh, so it's a collaborative grant and competitive grant. And in the, in the chapter we talk a bit about how a bunch of people emphasize that you know, the fact that the grant mechan granting mechanism that you, the NIH uses is this collaborative model as opposed to a competitive model sort of shaped a lot of the other, sort of in a sense, hierarchically shaping everything that flows below. Just to mention, this story uh, reminded me of um, when I read the detailed history of the internet, and particularly the uh, detailed history of ARPANET, and the way the, the publications of this managed the first eight years of the ARPANET. And this, um, so it's hierarchical, but also at the same time there was the consensus building process, um, uh, so it was nudging sometimes, uh, letting the users have their say. So very much, uh, I've seen many parallels, even though it's a completely different field, it's not uh, disease, uh, it's not medical, it's uh, an, a more traditional research project uh, <coughs> computer science, but I see some parallels, uh, and uh, I wonder whether it's, this way of running research projects is peculiar, peculiarly U.S. Based because the tradition, both in Italy, which is very serial top down, non involvement uh, of the officers in the research projects at all, and also at the, uh, the European level, with some slight exceptions, but very much is top down. There's nothing comparable to this. So I wonder if there is a natural cultural difference between the US and Europe. It's interesting. This reinforces my suggestion that uh, you might have. Uh, comparative data if you look at uh, other experiences. And they were thinking, my, my wife is a doctor, and I'm pretty aware about uh, how they deal these kind of issues in the cardiology sector, and it would be typically a top-down structure, which is called uh, the uh, Cardiologist Association, which is looking also into rare diseases, uh, and at some point they might decide uh, uh, top-down uh, to involve uh, um, uh, parents, uh, communities, and so on, but it would be in a way which is very different. There would be not an outside agency which is funding these communities. So probably if you look at experiences in other countries, you find that uh, similar issues are dealt with uh, according probably to broad cultural or uh, anthropological patterns in a different way. <laughs> which in some way is good because they, these are all laboratories to experiment and to see maybe something which is in terms of value not so good because it's hierarchical, it's working better in some situations. In other situations the community approach is better it, uh, and we may have surprises. 
Hallelujah, you know, just you know, they seem to be yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but based on what you said, also based on this, the simple reading of the history, since so also there is some flexibility, more nuanced way of budget success, like uh, especially now, the tendency here is how many publications, how many patterns, how many drugs, very supposedly objective, while your recounting of the history seems like uh, maybe in my age or in other places they are saying, well, since people are happy, it's like a successful project, so a bit more flexible. Yeah, it's interesting. That. I mean, they care. They definitely care about publications, right? So they definitely, when they apply to show that they've been publishing, and they, and they do, um, they don't. As far as I know, point to patents when they're talking about it, it's a measure of success. Um, a lot of it's um, participation rates in the longitudinal study. Right? So if you can get patients to continue to participate, that tells you something about your success, you know, success in recruitment um, uh, in, the, in the longitudinal study itself. And that, I think that's a recognition that the longitudinal study itself is sort of this longer term investment. Right, for doing very this kind of research, so that's kind of an interesting thing in that itself because uh, uh, it, you know, just continued recruitment, patient involvement, it's not really something that's direct, it's directly tangible, uh, but they, you know, they just recognize that it's, that it's important. Um, yeah, no, yeah, measures, measures for, you know, it'd be interesting to think about uh, the variety of different measures of success, right, uh, in these kinds of communities. Assuming that we want measures, just numbers. Yeah, but, you know, but alternative, right? So I would think even like, how many people are, are on that monthly conference call? Everyone. Is everyone there? Like, what's the participation rate? Because the participation rates in the 90% for this consortium and the 40% for some other consortium, that might tell me something about the capital that they're building as a group. That's a measure, but it's not a measure of saying, like, I'm kind of quantitative. Like, I, mean, I mean, you're doing quantitative stuff, so it's not, and that's a big, this is sort of outside from this project. We don't have very good measures for the variety of different things that have the value in innovation and knowledge and stuff. And so any way, you know, you know if, if participation rate in certain kinds of activities that are of the sort that are knowledge generating or human capital generating, that would be an output. It certainly, would, certainly get, wouldn't get picked up in, uh, you know, GDP measures or something, but still, yeah, it's still something. Yeah, my question uh, is related with the, the role of money, I mean, of financial uh, uh, resources, and, and potentially, no, wait, this one more, like wait one moment, because it's about the, the crowding out effect of money, especially the centrally administered with respect to participation and, and, and engagement. I mean, it's a kind of uh, quite, quite standard uh, re uh, result in several law and economics and, and institution analysis that if, if, if you put maybe too much money and too much powerful direct in incentives, you may have a crowding out effect with respect to some other participation incentive. Maybe in, in Italy, with a stronger uh, public health and welfare state, we have a top-down top, top -down approach also because several I mean, incentives are coming through uh, the, 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 the allocation of public money on various things, which is done centrally by a central state. So I, I don't know if in this or other case studies you, you saw some, some kind of evidence of uh, this crowding out effect. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have a uh, uh, thing with rare diseases. It's hard to imagine what's getting crowded out. Like what the other funding source would be. You know, what the other because it's also they're not funding. It's a very small amount of money that comes from the NIH. <laughs> so I understand your question. It's you know, NIH funding over here might be crowding out something that would otherwise happen, right? So the private sector might otherwise invest, or maybe universities or some other nonprofit, or the patient advocacy group. Maybe they would sort of fund the institutional stuff. Um, uh, you know, I don't have it, but you know, one, one interesting thing to do would be just to do this study on ten. NIH funded RDCRN member type groups, and then do the same study for 10 rare disease research consortia that operate without any NIH funding. Because there are, there are there's, like I said, there's two to 5,000 rare disease research consortia. Diseases out there, in the vast majority of them have some kind of consortia. So you go and you look at 
consortia, you know, pick a bunch randomly of consortia which don't have anything to do with the, the NH. It's, such, it's only 1.25 million per year, so it might not even be worth, some of them it might not be worth the hassle of trying to build the infrastructure to be able to apply and do all this stuff. They may just do things on their own. Maybe they've got a really active, well-funded patient advocacy group because some, sometimes these things get funded because, uh, you know, a very wealthy person has a child who has one of these rare diseases, and all of a sudden they, they dump a lot of money in that particular rare disease research. So, you know, there's probably some of those where they're not, you know, relying on the NIH. And then there's probably some others that are just, you know, making do somehow without it. Maybe they're a crowdfunded approach. You know, so I don't know. I think that's a good, it's an interesting point to sort of see if you could study a bunch of different similarly situated research consortia and then ask, you know, what's the impact of, the, you know, money from NIH versus money from crowdfunding versus, you know, market funding, not interesting else. Interesting, I don't know. Well, all right. Well, maybe Anyone interested in doing an odds count study? Have I, have, I, have I recruited anybody? Anybody out there? You on the internet, anyone? <laughs> no, but I have a suggestion about uh, possibly applying this framework to, to one uh, uh, case study which has been performed by, by Bodo Balsas, which, which is the one a former member of Comunia, but also of a network of, of Internet and Society Centers, uh, uh, about uh, piracy and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. So it's an illegal network with some details of, of sharing and uh, uh, certain things uh, un under certain conditions. It was uh, quite, quite in, in interesting. And the another thing which is more uh, 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 related with some ongoing uh, research here at, at NEXA is uh, whether uh, maybe some of these uh, uh, case study could uh, could be could, 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 could provide some in, insights for uh, let's say the working of, of the public uh, administration. I mean it's a strange list. Part of it could actually be a kind of knowledge common in the sense that there are uh, ex exchanges of practices, there are informal networks uh, on top of the very formal hierarchical ones, uh, and uh, the more we, uh, we, we, we in, in, in introduce uh, in, in infrastructure, in, in particular uh, IT infrastructure, the more we can have uh, uh, exchanges of uh, practices and ideas within big public administration which are not going along the traditional hierarchical channels but which are more horizontal. So since, since we are uh, starting this, 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 this topic, uh, it was curious whether some uh, specific case studies you are considering could, uh, could provide some incentive for such a strange beast in which you actually have a strong uh, hierarchy, maybe the, the core uh, task of this uh, organization is, is not to produce uh, uh, knowledge uh, or to share knowledge, but, but still there are some uh, infrastructure generating small knowledge commons, uh, like the small subs. Uh, yeah, I should say that the, uh, um, might as well, for, for a moment of clarity, the, when we talk about commons, right, a commons is never a thing or, or a resource or good, right? The commons is the governance institution. It's the, it's the means for managing resources. Um, where the resources could be the knowledge and could be a bunch of other resources that are sort of relevant to the knowledge resources that we're managing, right? So the reason I say that is it's absolutely the case that public administrations in fact construct their own knowledge. Just like firms do, right? Just like biker gangs do. Like, so and again, if you've got membership, you got members of some community that system, it's got to be systematically sort of institutionalized, right? So if it's just random that there's information sharing between an N greater than two, that doesn't create a community where there's members and non-members and it's not really uh, what we're talking about. But where, you know, public administration is sort of a bunch of repeat actors in a community, right, who share, have 
norms and other institutions by which they systematize their information sharing. So that they can't, the output of the organization doesn't have any knowledge. The output of the organization could be widgets, or it could be, you know, the administration of law or something else. But the point is, is that the organization is has some means for coordinating the sharing, the generation of and sharing of knowledge, ideas, information, data, all kinds of those, those sorts of resources internal to the to the group. So uh, Amy Kopchinsky at Yale at the Medical Research Commons gave a, gave a paper, Is Pfizer a Commons? Um, to which my response was, no, Pfizer itself is not a Commons. Pfizer is a company, right? Um, commons are things. Um, but Pfizer absolutely manages a whole host of resources inside its organization as uh, Commons. It manages a lot of knowledge as a Commons. Internally, where members of the community get to access on certain terms and conditions, and non-members don't, right? And some of that facilitates the production of a variety of outputs, some of which are public goods and some of which are private goods that flow out of the company and are sold in markets. So sometimes people think commons means there's no market, and that's not my position, right? So there are entities within markets that employ commons as a mode of managing knowledge, right? And there are in governments, and there are in community, Social, I'm still figuring out what the third provisioning system is. This is a different project on a comparative institutional analysis. But you know, there's market systems and government systems where they take demand to be different by market systems. They rely on price signals about what people want. Governments take um, you know, the information about demand that's manifested in political systems and voting and other behaviors to figure out what it is to provide. That third social system, community system of provision, like families and, and, and other kinds of social organizations that are not market, not government, that rely on different demand signals to figure out what it is that they want. Point being that commons exist in all three of those sectors or those systems uh, because commons are just a mode of managing knowledge. So yeah, I think that's a very long winded way to say yes. Yeah. yeah, I think no, definitely yeah, in yeah, the administration. Yes, yes, but uh, are you performing any any case study which is concerning some, oh, some knowledge comes from commons within public administration or something similar? I, not that I, not on our plate right now. Like, like I said, so what we're, so my, the case study I'm currently working on is the second rare disease research consortium. So the, uh, well, we're all going to be, the three, Mike Mass and Kathy Strandberg and myself are working on the next book, which will be a medical research commons book, which will have a bunch of case studies on medical research, law specialties, or innovation studies. Um, and we're plotting out and thinking about the third or the fourth or the fifth conference slash book and like what the next steps would be. And you know, we're very open to the idea of one ideas from others and then collaborators who would be willing to sort of host a conference and sort of so if you want to do a conference here on public administration commons, knowledge commons. So knowledge coming within public administration, and then get a bunch of, attract a dozen or so case study authors um, who are interested in public administration, different kinds of public administration. So I, I vary the types of public administration knowledge comments you want to study. And then you produce, a, you have a conference on that. It, it can merge with the illegal knowledge commons. Sometimes they overlap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to congratulate on our communication. I find that this subject is extremely slippery. If you think it, your first part was theoretical, the second was a case study. And they're difficult to communicate, in my opinion, and uh, this is what uh, your skill uh, consisted in. The first one, because some things appear, as you said, underwhelming, like the lady Ostrom has been studying so seriously for 30 years, and complexity should be taken into account, and it should not uh, oversimplify, allegories may be misleading, and so on. This is something which may sound underwhelming in some ways, but then, if you put it to test, uh, this idea that free riding is such an important problem, which it is not, if you don't start to think along these lines you were advocating, it's, it's not so obvious because so many people start on the idea that yes, this is a public good, innovation, activities, and you need to avoid free riding, and you have all of these possibilities, nothing else, but this is not true. And 
So, uh, there is a real point in preaching that uh, you should uh, avoid generalizations, and generalizations are bad, but there are uh, meta principles, as you call them, which are good, and it is important to start to distinguish between the ones and the others. But it's difficult to communicate, I think. You, you were able to do this, but I imagine that you had this problem all over when you do the theoretical part. And the case study is difficult for the opposite reason, because it is so specific uh, that it's not obvious that it has links to the other case studies and with the theory. So it, it is slippery in the sense uh, that uh, you say a lot of times it is this way, but it may be a different way. This is the design which is probably optimal, but maybe we could uh, fit it into the broader picture, or maybe the design might be different. So the obvious, when we come to conference, and this is also, has to do also with the idea of pitch. When you have an idea, you have to have a pitch, which uh, is a, common, a selling point. But then, from the audience, uh, Usually people listen to you say, what is the take-home lesson I had? And the whole point, and you, you said this when you talked about uh, the question the journalist was asking you, there is not a take-home lesson, actually. And the whole point is that there should not be a take-home lesson, because complexity is not a take-home lesson. And I find that uh, in both cases you have the same communication difficulties and so I congratulate on having been able to overcome this uh, twin difficulties so well. So thank you again. Oh, thanks. Well, I mean, that's the table lesson. <laughs> <laughs> no, something that you complexity, respect to the complexity, pay attention to history, and, uh, and helping debunk yet again, because we've already had a generation to do it, difficult. Debunking some very simple, powerful ideas that appeal to the mind and uh, through the centuries, because now it's more than two centuries. Three centuries, actually. Uh, three, three centuries. Yeah. About three writing, I think that this but is. The thing about the mechanical system is the way of human beings, at the very least, for the scientific beings. And uh, uh, so powerful, and uh, so it requires a constant reminder that they're simple, that uh, they're, uh, only, they're simplifying, oversimplifying. So, so here's like a, here's a so I was asked not only by the journalist thinking about the, the book in particular, but I was also asked because I'm giving this a version of this talk to another audience, which will be filled with uh, intellectual property economist types. And uh, the person who's, who's hosting says, "Well, you know, you might want to think about like a way to really emphasize the relevance of this project to intellectual property law in particular." And so, you know, I was thinking about that, and so the one, one thing I want to emphasize is that free riding as an allegory drives a certain kind of thinking about intellectual property, a certain kind of design for intellectual property, but it doesn't. Once we tear down, you know, we recognize that free riding is sometimes good, sometimes bad, it's more complicated, you know, we want to study it more often, Collins actually often work. Um, it doesn't mean intellectual property goes away. It, it may mean that intellectual property just plays a different functional role and that its design might look very different. So, for example, open source software, right, is it open source software production systems often sort of are knowledge commons constructed with uh, copyright licenses. That copyright law plays a role in enabling the construction of a commons, right? Not about you know, the classic free riding exclusion story, it's just a different story. It's a different sort of set of phenomena that you're talking about. Um, and similarly, so you could, so it's, it's, uh, uh, same thing with like a patent pool. Sometimes you can think of pulling patents that, pulling a patent could be a cartel, or pulling a patent could be a way to overcome an anti-commons problem because you have too many patents that are blocking people from making progress, right? right? And so, it may be that systematically studying these things leads you to, uh, to understand sort of a different role. Uh, and it may be that you know, copyright, patent, and trademark themselves and trade secrecy and here, you know, design rights and some generous stuff. But it may be that you know, there's just maybe there's simpler models to accomplish different ends. Maybe it means you know, there's a variety of things that would open up research avenues in terms of intellectual property. Let me summarize the point you're making you by referring to footnote I had in my last article about uh, uh, 
the twilight of exclusivity might be. And I have a, um, it, it is broad, it's copyright, it's patent, it's uh, across the different IP products. And I have a footnote say, at some point I think that I should stop teaching intellectual property and I should be teaching intellectual property and commerce. Because I'm, I'm not negating the one, but I think that the, the blend, the mix is changing all the time and that there are uh, many alternatives and not only alternatives that, uh, as you were saying, uh, IP protection, uh, copyright protection <coughs> may be a basis uh, for uh, cooperation, uh, in the co cooperation based innovation and the like. It is just that we had three centuries in which uh, the property rights based approach has been prevailing. This is no longer true in, uh, this was not before, uh, has not been uh, for thousands of years. It's interesting because they, they, that's a good, I, I, I take that one step further and say it's not intellectual property and common. Right? It's in all property as semi-commons, right? So the way, I, this is in chapter 12 of the infrastructure book, but again, it's levels, right? So at the broadest level, think about the cultural environment, like all of the intellectual resources that we inherit, that we sort of live in and experience on a daily basis, right? Overwhelming vast majority of that is outside, is generated and shared outside of intellectual property media markets and without government subsidy, right? Um, uh, we inherit tons of culture and ideas. We, you know, so that the idea that the cultural environment at the broadest abstract level is a kind of default commons, right, I would say. And then if you think about intellectual property systems, patent, copyright, and so on, as ex exceptions from that default that enclose some, for, for good reasons, enclose certain portions of that cultural environment, right, in order to enable certain sets of activities that would better socially beneficial. Right? And then even then drop down a level, macro to mezzo, at the mezzo level, okay, now we zoom in like we did here, zoom in on intellectual property, copyright, let's say, do the same thing with that. Zoom in on that instead of institutions. And in fact, what do you see? Again, you see you see commons and exclusion. Right? So intellectual property is fundamentally about structured exclusivity as well as structured freedom. User freedoms as well as exclusivity, right? Both. With the semi commons private rights and, and commons that are interdependent and intertwined. Right? Even if you go from the meso level and zoom in on a particular, and, and there's relationships between the macro and white and meso, which is why it's sort of in a sense nested. Even if you zoom in on a, a work, a copyright protected work, right? So you take a book, my book. Even that work itself at the micro level is a semi commons. Right? Oh, it's private. Exclusive. There's some exclusive private rights with respect to the expression in that book. But the and facts. also tangibly owned it, so it owns the particular copy. You know, but the facts, the idea, I can, you can take the ideas, you can take the facts, the scenes off there, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of stuff that's just absolutely free and common in the book itself. So the, at the macro, at the meso, at the micro level, commons, commons, commons. And IP plays a really important role at the, at the meso and micro level in terms of letting certain activities happen. An important thing to realize that uh, the uh, last three centuries, uh, are the last three centuries, there is an important discontinuity in the role of nation states, the role of books, the role of property rights and intellectual property, and uh, that. Uh, Digital has changed much of this. In many ways, we are back at the mix of what was uh, before the Industrial Revolution and uh, what uh, is now. So we are in a time in which uh, the past, the good parts of the past, and uh, uh, the good parts of uh, the last century should merge. And this is why we should redesign the rules, except that we cannot have them redesigned uh, Top down by national regulators or sovereigns, but we have to rethink about the norm setting process, which is very different, should be very different, but this is a totally different story, I'm afraid. Okay, I think that this was wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.